Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our worship services this morning. This Sunday, just like every Sunday, we gather to celebrate and reflect on the gospel, that which is of first importance to us. But unlike most other Sunday mornings, we get to do that in a special way, a fresh way this morning, as we participate in the Lord's table at the end of our services. So I hope throughout this whole service, we will be meditating on, reflecting on the death of the burial and resurrection of our Lord and what that has accomplished for us. Listen as I read from Galatians 2.20 to start us off. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I pray that this morning we are struck once again by the beauty and the delight of our Savior and what he accomplished for us because we found it to be everything for us. Amen. Let's start by standing and singing together that our Savior is alive. Savior is alive this morning, and that gives us confidence to walk this life by faith in him and not by sight. Let's continue singing together. Grand design. 
Glorious truths we have been singing this morning. I hope this week you've had opportunities to stand as a, a child of the promises of the Lord, to, uh, to walk by faith and not by sight, to fix your eyes on him, that he would be your reward uh, this coming week, as well as until we see him face to face. So glad you've joined us this morning to uh, worship our risen Savior. My name is Dustin Fold, and I have the privilege of serving as one of our um, pastors for this service to shepherd, to care, to pray for uh, this, uh, this service. So if I've not met you yet, I would love to do so. There's a connection card in the packet uh, in the back of the seat in front of you. If you could fill that out and put it in the offering plate when it comes around, we'd appreciate that. Or 
uh, use our Faith Church app, or come to the foyer and say hello to us in person after the service. We would delight in that, so please uh, take the opportunity to get more connected even today. I'd encourage you to be praying for folks in our church family. Uh, Jay and Linda Schwartz's father passed away and went to be with the Lord this past week. Yadir Pena's mother passed away. And then Keith Schultes died Friday evening. And so I'd encourage you to pray for his wife Donna and children Kelly and Jennifer. Uh, the funeral will be Saturday, July 30th with visitation from uh, 1.30 to 3.30. And then the service will be right after the visitation at 3.30. And that will take place um, at Solar Baker on Twickenham. So please be in prayer for, um, for Keith Schulte's family, if you would. Um, also, Wanda Smith had surgery this week. She's recovering. And then Rebecca Buono is going to have a double knee replacement surgery. So if you know Rebecca, that's probably the only way to slow her down. Um, but she's going to have both of her knees um, replaced. So pray for her uh, surgery and recovery. And then Paula Schleeman is also sick and is asking for prayer. So uh, let's go before the Lord together, shall we? Father God, we come before you and we want to stand as children of the promise. We want our stability to come from what you say and what you say is going to happen and from who you are. Lord, help us to fix our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of faith. Lord, help us not trust our own way of thinking, but help us walk by faith. Help us walk in a way that honors you by trusting you, especially your death, your burial, your resurrection as the only hope of heaven. Lord, as we celebrate the Lord's table today, I pray that you would be honored and that we will think about what you have done and we will wait expectedly and look forward to your return. Lord, help us long to see you face to face when our faith will become sight. Lord, we come before you and we ask you to use us for your glory. We understand what a broken world this is. And Lord, we uh, rejoice in some things that have changed that are good regarding the sanctity of life. We rejoice in the overturning of Roe versus Wade. But Lord, we also understand that on Monday, the General Assembly of Indiana will meet and debate on what Indiana is gonna do in light of the overturning. So Lord, I do ask you to give our state legislatures wisdom. I pray, Lord, that you will move in their hearts that they would have a great fear of you and not a fear of other people and outside pressures. Lord, I pray that the sanctity of life would be honored because you, Lord, move in the hearts of leaders that life would be cherished because you cherish life and you came to die, to give your life so that sinners would not have to spend eternity in hell, separated from ever, forever, but would have eternal life. So Lord, I pray that what we do in our families, in our churches, in our state would reflect your love of life. Lord, help us to have a great fear of you a reverence for you and a care for life and not a fear of man. Lord, I pray for all of our fall ministries. Lord, we understand that school is around the corner. Lord, help us to enjoy our summer all to the praise of your name, to build deeper relationships with our friends, family, neighbors. Help us to keep ministering in your name to those people you've placed right around us. But Lord, help us prepare for a harvest. Help us prepare how you might use us in the fall to bring glory to your name. I pray, Lord, as we continue our worship service, we would be burdened to constantly bring glory to your name through our lives as we sing, as we pray, as we soak in your word, as we celebrate the Lord's table, as we go out into the world as your ambassadors, Lord, help us to have a burden to bring glory to your name because indeed you paid it all. Help us to be so overwhelmed by what you have done 
and that we want to pour out our lives for your glory and tell others of the good news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, as we give of our tithes and our offerings, may it be that the good news of Christ will be spread far and wide for your glory and not our own. We pray this in the strong, powerful, wonderful name of Jesus. Praise the one who paid our debt, a debt that we can never pay, and yet we get eternal, eternal value and benefit from. So uh, thank you, Josh. Thank you, worship team, for leading us to praise the one who paid the price we never, ever could pay. Well, let me start by asking you a question, as is uh, my general practice. What is more significant, a broken collarbone or a hangnail? I hate me a hangnail. I can't stand hangnails. They drive me crazy, but I'm going to go with a broken collarbone. What's more important, a broken collarbone or a ruptured spleen? 
This is just the sound of rectal spleen sounds really, really bad. Or how about this? What's worse? Cardiac arrest or plantar fasciitis? Medical professionals have to do what is known as medical triage, where they focus on what is most important and treat that first. If you have an abnormal heart rhythm, they are not going to help you with your plantar fasciitis. Your heart is more important than your foot in this case. Can you, can you imagine two doctors in the ER arguing when someone is in AFib, their heart is going 400 beats per minute, and they're arguing on the best way to treat plantar fasciitis. If it's a golf ball to loosen the tendon or a frozen water bottle. And they're just going back and forth when a patient is right there. Their life is on the line. No way. It's ridiculous. They would never do that. In the body of Christ, we too need to be aware of something called spiritual triage, where we're able to discern biblically what is most important so that we don't argue, criticize, disagree on things of tertiary importance rather than things of first importance. Medical triage focuses on the health of the individual. Spiritual triage focuses on the health of the body of Christ and the spiritual health of followers of Christ. And as you know, this summer we've been going through a 12-week series on handling criticism as part of our annual theme of growing in gospel gratitude. And today we continue our series on dealing with disagreements. We are free to disagree, but we are called to not devour and divide in a way that dishonors the unity we have in Christ. Galatians 5.13 says that you are called to freedom, brethren, but do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh or your own selfish desires, but through love serve one another. Paul wrote the first letter to the Corinthians because they were devouring each other. There were disagreements in the church that were causing problems. And just like a skilled triage nurse, he is assessing the spiritual symptoms for each disagreement and giving gospel-based responses that are needed for the congregation in Corinth to grow in unity and in purity. He starts early on in the letter by saying, I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree there be no divisions among you, that you be made complete in the same mind and the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. There are disagreement, uh, disagreements. <laughs> disagreements. There's a lot of them. They, he spends the first four chapters talking about how they disagree on who their favorite teacher is. Chapter 5 is all about the disagreement over sexual immorality. Chapter 6 is about church members suing each other. Chapter 6 goes on with more sexual immorality disagreements. Chapter 7 talks about singleness and marriage. Chapter 8 through 11 is all about handling your freedom and how do you eat food that may or may not have been sacrificed to idols. Chapter 11 is disagreements on head coverings. And then chapter 11 is about disagreements on how to observe the Lord's table. 12 through 14 is about the issue of spiritual gifts and the disagreement on those. And then chapter 15, our chapter today, is the, the disagreement on the bodily resurrection of believers. So all through the, the book of 1 Corinthians, there are disagreements and Paul grounds every response in the gospel. And then he culminates to help see all of these important disagreements to think about what is most important so that they can process disagreements in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. So please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as we read verses 1 through 6. 
If you need a Bible, there is one under the seat in front of you. On page 138 in the back section, you'll find the book of 1 Corinthians. Please follow along as I read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 6. Paul says, Now, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Disagreements between people happen in a family, at work, in church. Disagreements are going to happen. But can we have a gospel-focused approach to disagreements so that we can honor the Lord, prioritize what's most important, and not divide and become disunified? So this morning, as we talk about dealing with disagreements, I want to look at two keys to a gospel-based response to a disagreement. Number one, we must hold fast to the gospel. As I read, he says, Paul does, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. I want every believer to know where 1 Corinthians 15 is if they need to explain what the gospel is. It is right here, really clear. I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you. They've heard this before. They need to hear it again. The gospel which I preach to you, which you also received, in which you stand, by which you are saved, this is super important. If you hold fast to the word which I preach to you. Another disagreement. This time, the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And Paul again directs the attention to what are you holding fast to? What's going to be your stability to think about this challenging topic where people disagree? What are you holding on to? What's most important to you? What I've found is when I'm talking to people and they disagree, they have conflict, there's broken relationships. If they are holding on to something besides the gospel as most important, it's really hard, if not impossible, to find unity and to solve problems between believers if they're holding on to something else that is more important than who Christ is and what he did. If something else is more important, they're going to hold on to that and not humbly seek common ground or communicate in a way that honors the one who died for them. It seems so basic, but you must hold fast to the gospel. And in a lot of disagreements, the gospel is the furthest thing from people's minds. From the very beginning, Paul wants to set the tone and make sure the Corinthians go back to the gospel. And then they can process a huge amount of disagreements. He says at the very beginning of the chapter, of the book in chapter 1, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God. He's thankful for them. He focuses on the grace of God, which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him in all speech and knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. How Christ has worked in my heart and in your heart is to be what we hold fast to as the baseline, the foundation by which we have disagreements. But oftentimes, what I'm holding fast to and I disagree is, I think my way is best, I think I'm right, I don't think you've really understood me, or you're not listening to me, and I want you to listen to me and agree with me, and that's what I'm holding on to. My position 
being right is most important to me. So if I hold fast to the gospel, there's something interesting about it. I have received it, but it's not mine in the sense that I created it. I can't be territorial to defend it in a way that is self-focused. So hold fast to the gospel by acknowledging it's not your own. How, how, how many kids fight and argue because mine, mine, mine. This is my way of doing things. This is my idea. This is mine. It's precious to me. The gospel is precious. He says, this, I made known to you. I preached to you. You received this. It is something outside of himself. It is something outside of us that is objectively true that we grab onto. It does not emanate within us, so we don't have to try to t be territorial. We can share the gospel with others. Yes, we want to defend it, cherish it, but we hold on to it as something received, not as though someone is infringing upon our copyright. Galatians 1.15, Paul says, this is my ministry. I've been called to something bigger than myself. He says, but when God, who has set me apart from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Go to others who are not like him. The idea here is he's going to share the gospel, not view it as something as I, I just keep it to myself. We often view disagreements through something that I have needs to be protected. Whereas the gospel is something to be shared. But we should not be shaken because even though it's such good news, it's divisive. There are disagreements. Disagreements will accompany the gospel. A great resource if you don't have it on your bookshelf already, I might encourage you to invest in the book Peacemaker by Ken Sandy. It's a helpful resource, but on page 30, he provides a, a, a number of common causes for conflicts and disagreements. One, he says, is misunderstanding from poor communication. And, and we often don't communicate very clearly. And in a fallen world where we have imperfect uh, language, oftentimes there is conflict because of a miscommunication. Other times, though, he says it's caused by a difference in values or goals, or expectations, or interests. Paul knows that the gospel offers different values, different goals, different expectations, and different interests that now the Corinthians, who are coming out of a pagan, sexually immoral lifestyle, are going to struggle with changing all of their goals, changing the focus that they might have lived for years pursuing now needs to be transformed because of who Christ is and who they are in Christ. They have a whole new platform by which to stand before God and before others. However, the reality, and Paul emphasizes this, is that some may have heard the gospel, but they may not have truly believed. And part of the divisions might be because they really are not lined up with the goal of living for Jesus Christ above everything else. They may have different goals than following Christ. And he says to them, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. To believe in vain means empty belief or no belief. It's like lip service, but you don't actually truly believe. It's kind of like me saying, I mowed my lawn and I ran my lawnmower over my lawn back and forth, but I never turned it on. Did I really mow my lawn? Or did I, my, I mow my lawn in vain? I didn't actually do it. And so he puts a caveat in there to the Corinthians 
Because the reality is it's easy sometimes to be around the things of God and to never actually repent and place your faith in Christ in a genuine way. If you've been around the things of God and you've never truly repented and admitted your sin and placed your faith in Christ, that he is your Lord above all else, I would encourage you to do so even today. Because the reality is we have a treasure that's more valuable than anything else. Truth is a treasure to protect. We hold fast to the gospel by viewing it as a treasure of great value. Paul says to Timothy, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure that has been entrusted to you. The treasure is not Timothy's opinion on the best way to do something. The treasure is the good news that the Messiah has come and, and died, been buried, and resurrected so that all those who trust in him may have eternal life. That is the treasure that Timothy is to not be ashamed to share with others. Paul wants Timothy to have a strong foundation, just like he wants the Corinthians to have a strong foundation as well. And the reality is when we hold fast to the gospel, believers can stand on a stable foundation because we stand on the truth. The gospel I preached to you, what you received, in which also you stand. If somebody disagrees with you, does it ever shake you? Does it ever frustrate you? If you have this idea and somebody says, that's dumb, you're like, oh, thank you so much for your feedback. Or do, do, do people ever say things to you that are kind of simple, but they really bother you? You get really defensive to defend your decision? Anybody ever said, are you going to wear that? I, I was. Why did you load the dishwasher that way? That's the only way to do it. Why did you buy a John Deere lawn tractor? It was green. I like green. I don't know. Don't we find stability if we think people agree with us and think that our ideas are smart and good and are going to bear good fruit? And if they think that we didn't do a good job or we made a bad decision, it bothers us. And then we feel the need to try to convince them, I did it because of this, 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 and this, and this. It was a good decision. And they're like, no, I, I disagree. And it frustrates us because I don't like your view and I want to try to make you agree with me that I'm not an idiot. There is no stability that comes from trying to get someone else to agree with you so that you feel like you're on solid ground. The gospel is more stable because it's not based on man's work or our ability to control other people and how they think of us. The gospel is more stable because it's based on God's work. Second Timothy says, I suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted him to that day. People disagreed with Paul. And he suffered for it. We don't have to worry about other people agreeing with us to have stability. Because the gospel of John says that no one can snatch us out of the Father's hand. That the Holy Spirit has, has sealed us until the day of redemption. So I have stability in the gospel, not in other people agreeing with me. And then I can live in light of the gospel in a stable way that's not controlled by the roller coaster of emotions. If you tie your cart to someone else's view of you, you can live in light of the gospel in a stable way because of the, the spirit-empowered work. As you live out your salvation and you're not doing it all by yourself, the Holy Spirit that dwells in you is going to help you guard the truth of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection that defines who you are and where your hope is and where you get stability from. 
So if someone says to you, I don't like your decision, or why did you do that? Ask yourself, what am I going to hold on to in this moment? John Deere lawnmower, you like Club Cadet lawnmower. If someone says PCs are better than Mac, Levi's are better than Arizona jeans, or the, the Colts are better than the Vikings, it's not worth arguing because they're right. The Colts are better than the Vikings. <laughs> Everyone is better than the Vikings. It is hard being a Vikings fan, and that is objective truth. <laughs> but seriously, in disagreements... We often focus so much on our preferences rather than what is objectively true. And I just want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, hold fast to what is true. Do not hold fast to your preferences. What, if, what is true is sobering. Romans has 11 chapters of the truth of the gospel in all its glory. And it says something that is true and something that shows that there's a threat to truth. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Many people in our culture don't want to discuss if something is true objectively. But they'd rather focus on what is popular and what is liked. They want to suppress what is true and exalt what is popular. And one of the best ways to do that is to pit people against others based on their preferences. Some topic, any topic, pick a topic. We could do something incredibly simple. And everybody in this room could disagree and have a big argument over the simplest thing. If you want to test this theory out, at lunchtime, throw this doozy to your family and ask them this debate question. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Ask them that silly question and sit back and watch people passionately, logically argue why or why not it's a sandwich. And then and watch them change their position and then watch somebody want to go get a hot dog. Believers must not get caught up in disagreements of preferences and opinion that distract us from the sobering truth that one day God is going to pour out his wrath upon mankind, upon all ungodliness. And if we direct conversations to that truth, people might not want to talk to us or they might disagree with us. And we can't be afraid of those kinds of discussions. And we don't want to waste all of our energy on hot dog arguments. I just want to encourage you to think about what you're holding fast to when you get into a difficult conversation. Are you looking for an opportunity to talk about how mankind is sinful? Which is not a popular opinion, but it's a truth from the Bible. Or how much we need a Savior and how Christ actually came and died and was resurrected. That is going to guide you so much better than trying to defend yourself or get someone else to agree with you. How are you going to direct the conversation back to a passage like 1 Corinthians 15? Because you, you know it so well and you know it's most important that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So the first step is make sure your heart is calibrated to hold fast to the gospel. But the second, how do you process genuine disagreements that don't focus on tractors or football teams, but doctrine, theology, what it looks like to walk in a way that honors the Lord. How do you connect everything to the gospel so you can disagree in a healthy way but not divide in a sinful way? Well, we want to make sure we assess what is of first importance. And again, it is the gospel. The reality is not all disagreements have the same impact. 
Not everything is of equal importance when we discuss things. Part of our strategic ministry plan is to refresh the Faith East campus. What color is the carpet going to be? What's going to go on the wall? Things of that. At times, that discussion can divide churches. And we want to recognize that it's good to be a good steward of one's facilities, but we don't want to divide over things that do not exalt the person and work of Christ. Some disagreements are more important than others. So how do you navigate that? In your mind, you want to respond again in a way that's based on gospel impact. You go back to the theological triage idea. Here's an image that can help us think about theological disagreements. There's three categories in this pyramid. So if you disagree, the question is, are you disagreeing on a category one, a category two, or a category three level? Now, different churches might stack up these categories in different ways, but the point is, are you aware in your mind what category you believe you're in when you are disagreeing? The first category, number one, is most important. It defines the essence of biblical Christianity. It's known as the the fundamentals of the faith. If I'm talking to someone and they say, I believe in Jesus. I believe he was a a really good man and he provides us a a good example to follow, but he's just a man. I can't say, well, that's just your opinion. That's just how you feel. At least we're both Christians. We can just kind of, you know, we love God and let's just go get a latte together. Or maybe a nitro cold brew with sweet cream. That'd be better. If someone says Jesus is just a man, that's a red flag. I'm in category one. I've got to lovingly throw the flag and disagree. Truth must be spoken, and I must lovingly put my relationship at risk to communicate category one level truth and disagree that Jesus did not say that about himself. In fact, he said in Colossians, the whole world was created by him And for him, and he holds everything together. No, just a man can do that. Paul is addressing the disagreement of the bodily resurrection of Jesus. He is saying that if it's just spiritual or just symbolic, then we will not be physically raised when we die, and the gospel is not good news at all. In fact, we're supposed to be pitied, and we have no hope if we die, and then that's the end. It is a first-tier issue because without Jesus rising from the dead, we have no hope of rising from the dead. And then he did not defeat death. And he promised that he would rise again. This is the core of the gospel message that he actually physically rose from the grave. If someone says, well, the gospel is just that we have to be really good and work our way to heaven, category one. I've got to lovingly disagree because Romans 3.28 says that a man is justified by faith apart, apart from works of the law. If someone says you have to be a good person and go to heaven, I've got to lovingly disagree and put my relationship at risk because I love the individual in front of me and I want them to know the truth that you can't earn your way to heaven. You need someone else to pay the price in full, just as we sang about. I don't want to argue, disagree all the time, but if I do, I want to make sure I'm in category one. Now, there are other categories. Category two, these are other important issues. Oftentimes, this is what usually differentiates churches. How a church is structured, who participates in the Lord's table, even gender roles in the church or mode of baptism. We don't need to argue with people or try to convince or change people, but we recognize we have the freedom to choose to covenant together as a community based on what we believe the Bible teaches about how the church is to be structured. But we understand that that's really important. But if I disagree with someone... I can disagree in a loving way. Or category three. This category is all about Christian liberty, 
areas of wisdom, difficult passages, passages that don't focus on the nature of God and the, the nature of salvation. If you're in my ABF, you know what I'm going to say next. Category three is the Nephilim category. Category three is all about the Nephilim. Because we don't trust the Nephilim for salvation. We don't trust the Nephilim for how we structure the church. Pardon the pun. But the Nephilim is not a giant issue. It's a question of who the Nephilim are. Are they giants? And so there's areas that are interesting that we can really dive into, but I don't want to divide from you if you think the Nephilim are a little different than I do. Now, this discussion becomes a bit academic, but there are good objective truths to help us navigate what category am I in? And there's no fear of disagreeing, but I want to know if I'm in category one, two, or three, because that's going to govern really the stand I take on things. However, no matter what category I'm in, I still want to stand on the gospel in a way that brings glory to God no matter what category I'm in. So I want to respond with a gospel witness. So the tone, the word choice, my patience, my gentleness, I want to speak the truth in love. I want to be ready to give my defense to share where my hope is in, but with gentleness and reverence. You can have a great impact and you can stand firm, but in a self-controlled, kind, loving way. Think about the gospel and how it can compel you or control you to view someone you disagree with in a way where the gospel is glorified or where, where Jesus is glorified and the gospel is pointed to. Think about how Christ died for our sins. So I disagree with somebody, but I'm going to focus on how I am a sinner who should be in hell right now. And so should you. And so I look at you with the common ground of we are both sinners who deserve to be in hell. I've got no standing by which to talk down to you and to disagree with you in a prideful way. Even if you are an enemy of me or an enemy of the Lord, God calls me to love my enemies because he died for me when I was his enemy, when I was a sinner. So that his love and sacrifice can overflow in my mind so I show the love of Christ even if I say what you're saying is not biblically true. I want to do so in a loving, humble way. He was raised on the third day. Christ is victorious. He defeated death and sin. And so I have an eternal hope. So I don't have to put my hope in a conversation going well or someone else liking me or someone else thinking that I'm smart or have everything together. I don't have to focus solely on today. I want my conversations to have an eternal impact. So I don't have to win. I don't have to be right in every disagreement. Because he has already been victorious at the cross in my place. And that victory is most important. So I don't have to win this conversation. If you get the last word, if it seems like you won, that's fine. Because I'm resting in the victory of Christ. Even after he resurrected people still didn't believe, even though he was walking around, revealing himself. People still did not believe, so I can trust the Lord will use me in his time and in his way, even if it seems like the conversation didn't go my way. How about according to the scriptures? When you have a disagreement, what authority do you appeal to? Do you appeal to your own authority? Oftentimes, when I help folks navigate disagreements, there's a lot of time talking about your thoughts and your feelings. It can consume the whole discussion. And there's very little time focused on what the scripture actually says. I just want to encourage you in disagreements are you referencing the Bible as your authority? Or 
Do you look for authority from your own passion, your own cleverness? Do you even then drift into manipulation or sinful anger or threats? I just want to encourage you to bear witness to the gospel by making sure you don't try to convince someone with power, but the power that comes from the word of God that you're referencing as your authority. Trust the Holy Spirit to convict people regarding unrighteousness, but be faithful, be a faithful steward to communicate clearly what the Bible actually says. And have courage to point people to the Bible, even if they disagree that the Bible is the word of God. Lastly, we can have confidence because he appeared to Cephas, the 12, and then 500 people, more than 500 people, at one time. We can be confident in the way we handle disagreements. We believe in the testimony of Christ. It is a matter of faith. We believe who he is, what he did, and we believe he's coming back. But we can hold fast to the gospel and have a stability because it's been historically verified by eyewitnesses. There is eyewitness testimony. So if somebody opposes us or disagrees with us, we don't have to be shaken because we can go back to the eyewitness account of more than 500 people who saw the resurrected Messiah. We have a reasonable thinking faith. We trust. We trust in what God has said. And what God has said is woven together magisterially in a way that has eyewitness accounts. We have a reasonable faith so that we can hold fast to the gospel and then stand unashamed of the proclamation of the good news even if people disagree and even deride us. So let us pray to that end, shall we? Father God, we come before you and we recognize that we disagree with people on so many things and our world is often marked with disagreement. Lord, help us not be afraid to stand and to speak the truth in love when we disagree, but Lord, help us to be governed by what's more important than winning an argument. Help us to hold fast to the gospel that we can navigate conversations back to the person and work of Jesus. Lord, help us to be wise to know categorically what kind of disagreement we are having so we can know how best to approach those conversations. And Lord, help us above all else want to walk in a manner that pleases you and bears your image so that others who interact with us would know they have interacted with a follower of Christ so that you are exalted and that they would be in the best position to place their trust in the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We pray this. In the strong, powerful, wonderful name of Jesus, amen. Amen. We get to respond this morning by celebrating together what is of first importance, the death of our Lord, and to prepare our hearts for communion. Will you stand and, and let's sing of the Father's deep, deep love for us. love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. Which mar the chosen one, bring many sons to glory.
a delight to worship with you this morning. As we observe the Lord's table, it's an opportunity for believers to come together in unity with a thankfulness, a gratitude for the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. You know, as I said earlier, even in the early days, the early church in Corinth struggled even with division, even around the Lord's table. Because some believe because of their position, they could go first and not wait for other church members to come and enjoy the Lord's table together. And yet the gospel again puts everything in perspective. Jesus, the one who had the ultimate position, who is first, came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So as we celebrate and recognize what he has done, may it allow us to celebrate him to grow in thankfulness and humility so that we come together in unity and put others above ourselves. As we celebrate the Lord's table, let's remember what Jesus has done, laying down his rights so that his death, burial, and resurrection could bring us life. Men, would you please come serve us at this time? We practice open communion here. What that means is that you do not have to be a member of Faith Church to participate. But the Bible does require that you have trusted in the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus as your only hope of salvation, and that you have addressed any known sin in your life. So if you have not come to a place of saving knowledge, of trusting Christ, or you have not addressed any known sin in your life, I would encourage you to simply allow the elements to pass by. 1 Corinthians 11.23 states, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread and gave thanks. Jake, would you give thanks for the body of our Lord? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for your word, we thank you for your grace, we thank you for your mercy, and we thank you for your body that you willingly gave up for us. 
as a sacrifice for our sins. I pray, Lord, that as we take this bread, that we would turn to you in faith and examine ourselves and just be willing to confess any known sins, Lord. And I pray that we would do all this in genuine faith to the praise and glory of your name. Amen. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also. Nathan, will you give thanks for the blood of our Lord? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we give thanks to you that it was Jesus' blood that was shed for us. We remember that it cleanses us of our sins from yesterday, for today, and through tomorrow. And although it is red, we are made white because of that sacrifice, white as snow. We thank you that we look forward to an eternity with you because of it. In these things we pray, amen.
He said, this cup is the covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I hope this has been a meaningful service for you and it helps you to grow in gospel gratitude, and even how you might handle disagreements in your life. I just have a few announcements for you this morning. If I've not met you yet, if you're new, I'd love to meet you in the foyer. We have a place where you can say hello, so please uh, take that opportunity. Also, please mark your calendars. Sunday, July 31st is uh, the Women's Ice Cream Social. And so Sandy Escar is going to be given a challenge. I mean, what's better, ice cream and Sandy Escar? I mean, it's going to be a win-win. And so I'd encourage you uh, ladies to sign up at faithlafayette.org women 
as you seek to grow deeper in your relationships with other ladies in the church. Also, please be sure to grab one of the strategic ministry plans in the foyer. If you've not done so, I really want to encourage you to read through that and pray. Pray through that and consider, are there some areas that you would want to be a part of to use your gifts, ability, time, and resources to help us grow? So please contact the church, contact me, um, contact someone so that you can see how best to be a part of the strategic ministry plan. Also want to encourage you to put on your calendars our annual stewardship celebration. That's at the Tip of New County Fairgrounds this year at 5 o'clock on November 20th. That is where we're going to reveal the final results of what we uh, see the Lord has allowed us to commit to together. So please look forward to that. Also, please look forward to Church Family Night, August 7th, where we're again going to celebrate the Lord's Table together, pray for our upcoming fall ministries, and to enjoy fellowship in the body as well, as well as celebrate believers following the Lord in baptism and sharing their salvation testimony. So mark your dates, August 7th for Church Family Night. After Church Family Night, we're going to have a call out if you'd like to serve in the uh, Christmas cantata. I'm sure some of you are already listening to Christmas music. And so if you want to do that in a group, feel free to do so at the call out for being a part of the Christmas cantata. Again, that's taking place August 7th in the auditorium right after Church Family Night. So please uh, put that on your calendars as well. Again, I pray this has been an edifying time for you. Please enjoy the rest of your Sunday to the glory of God. Have a great day. Yeah.